to begin, there is nothing more beloved to Allah than two drops and two traces. That's what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam one time said to the Sahaba, لَيْسَ شَيْءٌ أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنْ قَطْرَتَيْنِ وَأَثَرَيْنِ There is nothing more dear, more precious to Allah than two drops and two traces, two marks. And so we will count them together in this afternoon, inshaAllah ta'ala, commit them to memory and pursue them in our lives, inshaAllah. He said, قَطْرَةُ الدُّمُوعِ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ The first of the two drops is the drops of tears. The tear drops that fall out of the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. The early Muslims were actually very keen on verifying or confirming or seeking out that very specific tear. The tear that fell out of sincere longing for Allah or fearfulness of Allah or hope in Allah or remorse before Allah Azza wa Jal subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were overcome by the passion of that moment and its heat so their eyes overflowed. Because they also heard that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that in the heat of the day of judgment, a select few people will have Allah's shade, will be spared of that heat. One of them is رَجُلٌ ذَكَرَ اللَّهَ خَالِيَةً A person who remembers Allah alone or remembers Allah while alone. Could go both ways. And so his eyes overflow with tears. And they were also keen on confirming, is this that tear that is so sincere that it will earn me that? Because people cry for all different reasons. You know Sahl ibn Abdullah Tustari, a great early scholar, rahimahullah, when he read the verse in Surah Yusuf that the brothers of Joseph, after betraying him and throwing him into a well, they came back to their father in the dark, weeping, crying. He stopped for a second and said, this ayah reminds us that when a person reaches peak wickedness, they can cry on cue. In other words, not all crying is what it seems. To others or to yourself. You could be crying because people are watching in a pretentious, pretending way. And you could be crying for yourself to tell yourself, let me cleanse my conscience by crying on this day in my house of worship, whatever religion you may follow, so I can go back to living it up for the rest of the week. People do this all the time. And so they were conscious of this. Which tear is this one? And that's why Muhammad ibn Wasi' rahimahullah, another of the early Muslims, he used to say, the one who is fearful of Allah is not the one who simply sheds tears. Rather, he is the one who gives up the thing that he fears he will be punished because of. What is the point to cry and then you just go back to doing it all over again? That's not enough fear. You need enough fear to snap out of it for Allah to know that you've really feared God. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ibn Ata, one of the later scholars in the later centuries, though hundreds of years before us, he very beautifully said, لا واردا لا تعلم ثمرته. Don't validate or give too much credit to some emotional or experience, spiritual experience you're having until you first check what are its fruits, what does it produce. He said, because the point of the clouds is not to give us rain. The point of the clouds is to cause things to grow. It's not just the water falling. I mean, a very beautiful metaphor. It's not just the water falling, right? It's not the liquid. It's what did this actually allow to come to fruition, to come to being. And Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, the Abu Bakr al-Siddiq of the Tabi'een, of the next generation after the Sahaba, Sufyan used to even go as far as saying that there are so many different kinds of crying for so many different reasons. They're not all bad, right? He's saying, but that one that is sincerely for Allah, if it comes, he's saying this, if it comes annually, if it comes once a year, it's enough. But still, they would seek it. Why? Because they knew how much Allah valued it. They knew that one sincere tear 
can wash away a lifetime of defiance, a lifetime of disbelief, a lifetime of wickedness, a lifetime of being a runaway slave from the path of Allah Azza wa Jal, it can all be drowned under that one tear. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the one that said, two eyes that the fire will never touch. Meaning whomever possesses these two eyes, the fire will never touch them. One eye that lost sleep guarding the Muslims throughout the night in the path of Allah Azza wa Jal, and one eye that wept out of the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal, the mighty and majestic. So Allah wants us to have tender hearts, responsive to Him, sympathetic with human suffering, all of it together, that is it. That is what He is calling us to, and of its symbols is that you weep when it's time to weep. May Allah grant us all tender hearts and tearful eyes for the right reasons. Protect us from having hearts that are hard and eyes that are forever dry. And protect us also from crying tears that are deceptive, crocodile tears with which we deceive ourselves or others. Allahumma ameen. And the super fix or the shortcut or the only real key to developing that tender heart and that wet eye that Allah loves is reflecting on the Qur'an deeply in private. That is the greatest cure and the greatest component to cultivating that one drop that Allah loves so much. Then he, when he went on to say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَقَطْرَةُ دَمٍ تُهْرَاقُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ The second of the two drops that Allah loves is the drop of blood that was spilled for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal, in the path of Allah Azza wa Jal, seeking by it commitment to Allah, the Most High, the ultimately good. And there's two things I wish to say clearly and quickly here because that may not have as much application at first thought for many of us here today. But why is this drop of blood so valuable to Allah Azza wa Jal? It is not because warfare and violence and bloodshed, all of the ayat, my brothers and sisters, all of the ahadith that encourage you to be brave on the battlefield, to encourage you to glorify martyrdom when its time may come, is because this is an inevitable reality in the human experience, not because this is an ideal state for humanity that Islam seeks to standardize, perpetual warfare. No. Allah Azza wa Jal says, don't wish to meet your enemy on the battlefield. Right? But if you meet them, stand firm. How do I stand firm? By knowing that Allah loves that I take this stand. That I accept when He has said some things are worth fighting for. Like justice. That the innocent sometimes need to be protected by others when they cannot protect themselves. This is the idea of the just war theory, if you will, in Islam. And so that incentive is there because it is inevitable at times, even if we should be seeking and looking forward to and ever ready, as Allah said, فَإِن جَنَحُوا لِسَّلْمِ If they happen to incline to peace, فَجْنَحْ لَهَا وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Then you incline to it as well and put your trust in Allah. Don't be negative and so don't say there's no hope in humanity and it has to be this way and you know, down with the world because they want us down forever and... If they seek it, seek it as well. But the reality is not everyone will always seek it. And so it is in that context and in these moments that every ayah of jihad, every virtue of shahada, of martyrdom is to be understood. And he said to us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about its virtues, about how dear this sacrifice is with Allah and appreciated by Him, that when the martyr is killed, he does not find from the pain of being killed, except what one of you may experience when they're bitten by an insect, a mosquito bite. And that Allah washes away their lifetime of sins before, this is his wording, alayhi salatu wasalam, before the first drop of blood hits the ground. Nothing is more beloved to Allah than two drops and two traces. The first drop was the teardrop that fell sincerely for Allah. And the second drop was the drop of blood that was spilled in a believer when he was killed for the sake of Allah and in the path of Allah Azza wa Jal. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَأَمَّ الْأَثَرَانِ And as for the two traces, 
He said, أَثَرُ حَافِرٍ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ And this perhaps requires the most unpacking. He says, the trace of a horseshoe in the path of Allah Azza wa Jal. What does that mean? The steps that you didn't even take, you sat on a horseback, going off into battle, for example, that the horse left on the ground, which the wind will erase in a few moments, Allah loves to see it. Why? This is a profound lesson for every believer, that you too, what is the difference? You as a human being will be here for a few short moments, and then you will disappear as well, right? So it is really about any ground you cover, even if it does not seem directly related to the good deed, right? Anything you do that is even indirectly related to something pleasing to Allah, He will love it from you, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, even in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he arrived in Medina, and then he built his masjid and his house was next door, and naturally everyone wanted to relocate their house to be closer to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and so logistically, that wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> Centering it around, crowding all in one area when Allah's earth is vast. Even the city of Medina is wider than that. But he also gave them another reason to console them for, to stay a little bit further than others. And he said to one whole neighborhood, a family that lived in a whole neighborhood, as is reported in Sahih Muslim, Ya Bani Salama, O Banu Salama, O tribe of Salama, Diyarakum, keep your homes, don't relocate. Keep at your homes, tuktabu atharukum, because your footprints, not just about the horse, right? Your footprints will be written for you. Every time you take a step towards the masjid, you're walking farther than the guy that has greater proximity, so you will have greater reward than them. Every step you take towards trying to please him is of the most beloved things in the sight of Allah, even if it seems so transient even if it may seem to you so unrelated, so trivial. And the Qur'an itself said this. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala said, Inna nahnu nuhyi al-mawta. We give life to the dead. You're all going to die, then you're really going to come to life, right? For eternity. We're going to give life to the dead, and you will find out what after you're resurrected. He says, we give life to the dead. وَنَكْتُبُ أَثَارَهُ And we're the ones that write their traces. We're the ones that keep their impact lasting. You will go and get reconstructed, recreated, uh, revived back to life, and you will find that your traces are written. <laughs> we will write everything they sent forward to the Day of Judgment, because you can't keep it, can't take it with you to the Day of Judgment. I'll hold it for you. <laughs> and even their footsteps. And as the Prophet ﷺ also said about this super important principle, that if the day of judgment were starting, the world is about to wither away and crumble, and there is a baby tree in one of your hands, right? A sapling, and you have the ability just to stick it in the ground, stick it in the ground. Why? It's not going to bear fruit. It's not. It's not going to give anybody shade. It's not. But that does not prevent it from showing up it's traces of that effort showing up in your scale of good deeds. Because it's about your effort, it's not about results. And you don't know what Allah Azza wa can bring about of results. Many of the great results in this world, of the works of the righteous, didn't show up in their lifetime. Whether we're talking about Palestine or otherwise. By the way, before I sit down, do you know why the people of Moses, Banu Israel, were not allowed to enter the Promised Land? Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Al-Ma'idah that when they left Egypt, the tyranny of Fir'aun, they came to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, it was occupied by tyrants. Look at how the tables have turned, subhanAllah. And Musa alayhi salam said, just enter. It's going to be a walk in the park. It's going to be easier than you think. Just walk in on them. They will flee. It's not going to be what you think. These big, bad, powerful tyrants. And most people were too scared. Most people were too cowardly. They said, what can I provide? What effort can I contribute? Allah azza wa jal said, Qala rajulani min yakhafun. Two men that feared God spoke up. They exerted an effort even though there was a prophet present. They still said, it's my job to exert an effort. They said, just listen to Moses. But the people didn't listen to Moses. 
And that reminds us of two things, brothers and sisters. Number one, there were not enough people that understood God's law, put in the effort, individually speaking. And number two, the two individuals who spoke up, they were not listened to. But the fruit of their effort, the seed they cast out, what did it do? It landed in the greatest book. It landed in the Quran as inspiration for so many others. They didn't see its fruit, but we are still learning it until today. We are still harvesting it until today. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعد أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ونبيه ورسوله And so the first of the two traces Allah loved is a trace of a horse making strides en route to fighting in the path of Allah Azza wa Jal or carrying their rider to fight in the path of Allah. And so en route to pleasing Allah, put any dent, put any mark, extend any effort. And it could be hard. Sometimes there's self-doubt. It'll come over and over again. What can I possibly do? Sometimes there'll be doubt about others, that you're insincere, or you're a sinful person, or you're an incompetent person. And maybe even some of that may be true, but it should never translate into me not making some sort of ground, exerting some sort of impact. And the last of the two traces, the, the final of the list of four, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam, وَأَثَرُ فَرِيضَةٍ مِنْ فَرَائِضِ اللَّهِ And a trace, not that you inflict, but now a trace that is inflicted on you, a scratch, an inconvenience, a wound, something that's inflicted on you because you are upholding one of the duties, fara'id, the faridas, the obligations of Allah Azza wa Jal. And the scholar said what this could mean, for instance, is the marks that naturally, we don't intentionally, you know, uh, put these marks on our body, on our knees, or on the instep of our foot, or sometimes on people's forehead if their carpet is rougher than someone else's carpet. When you're praying for a lifetime, there's some marks on you. You may think it's nothing. For sure, it's not everything. It doesn't mean you're automatically more righteous. It just could be your skin is more sensitive. Your carpet is a little rougher. That's it. But if it is for Allah, even the smallest marks that are inflicted on you, Allah will celebrate them. In front of the creation, he loves them dearly, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing is more beloved to Allah. Also of the example of some dry skin you may find when you make your wudu for a lifetime or you make your wudu in the winter. And also what the scholars mention is maybe the bad odor, the inconvenience you may find in your breath against your will because you're fasting for Allah. That's another faridah, right? Whatever is inflicted upon you leaves a trace on you physically, emotionally, financially, is of the greatest marks that Allah Azza wa Jal preserves for the believers on the Day of Judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us a share of some of these drops and marks. May Allah carve for us a path to His pleasure. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us people of tearful eyes and tender hearts and bravery and valor when the, when the call is there. And make us of people that have some sort of impact even if we can't see its results immediately. And make us of those that withstand and appreciate the fact that Allah is a shakur, the one that will appreciate everything small and big that we extend for his pleasure. Allahumma ameen. May we be pleased to meet our Lord on the day that we discover the rewards that he built up for us. And may we be never of those who underestimate the agency he has gifted us.